Hello, everybody. I'm gonna do a little tour today, baby. I should I say a big tour? I'm gonna to cover a neighborhood that's been a little while in the making. Uh, been at, people have been asking for it. It's gigantic. It's the South Bronx. Right, I'm here next to Yankee Stadium. Maybe you've ever heard of that. Here's a little tidbit before we start. The Yankees used to be called the Highlanders. Did you know that, Cam? Yeah, I bet you did, you liar. Anyways, I'm gonna get ahead of myself. We got a, we got a lot of history to cover. Um, it's gonna be a good one. If you've never been to the Bronx, pretty amazing place. Tons and tons of history. You don't even know. You don't even know. That's why you're watching this video. Before we start, Cam, how are you doing? Oh, good, man. Oh, great. That's great to hear, man. I'm really, really pumped to hear that. Uh, before we start, guys, check out the Patreon. That's how we fund these things. That's how I keep the long underwear on my legs because uh, you know it's a little chilly. You gotta be, you gotta be safe. Also, if you like, uh, just go ahead and like and sub subscribe already. You know, you're gonna like this video. I can promise you that. If you've never seen one of these videos, you're in for a treat. And you can wait till the end, but do it anyway. Helps the old algorithm, as the tech heads like to tell me. All right, I'm rambling. Let's just get started, man. There's so much to cover. It's gonna be uh, bonkers. All right. Cam, you ready to do this? What are we still doing? I don't know. You don't have to be uh, rude about it, though. All right, let's do it. All right, so we're going to start at the beginning, guys. This whole area was all farmland for a long time. In fact, in 1639, uh, this man named Jonas Bronk, he bought a ton of acres here. And he died in 1670, and before, actually after he died they realized, oh we didn't name anything after this guy. So they named the Bronx River, Bronx Possessive River, huh? they named it after him. Uh, and later on, when it got pulled in to New York City, this area, and the area of the Bronx River, they were looking for a name for it, and they looked down and they saw the Bronx River, which by then had the X, uh, and they just gave it uh, the Bronx. And the reason it's the Bronx is because it was the Bronx River. Ah, oh, look at that. Damn, we just started this freaking video and you're already learning stuff like that. Come on. Anyway, I'm starting here in front of what is St. Anne's Church. So Governor Morris, the Morris family, Morrisania, which is a neighborhood up here in the South Bronx. Ah, oh, the Morris family. Governor Morris II, Jr., actually named this after his mother. This is the oldest church in the Bronx. Uh, and he named it after his mom, St. Anne. Not an actual saint, but St. Anne, his mom. Ah. It's a good thing her name wasn't, you know, Bambi or Trixie or something, but they named it St. Anne's. This is the old 1841. By the way, Governor Morris, uh, yeah, that was his first name, Governor. Yeah, I guess his life would have been very different if his name was Comptroller or something, but he was actually the son and descendant of Governor Morris, and of course his name was Governor, so he was a senator, which makes a lot of sense, but very famous family. Uh, he, he signed the Constitution and all this stuff. Morrisania comes from them. So it wasn't until like 1841 that some of their land started getting sold off. In fact, in 1841, the land was sold by the Morris family to a man named Jordan Mott. Some land, about 200 acres, was sold to Jordan Mott, Mott Haven, a little to the south. Uh, and Mott Haven set up a little community there. He built a foundry and it became a little village. All this stuff became a village. And in fact, in 1841, the Harlem and New York Railroad made its way up here and it had stops along the way, like in Morrisania, et cetera. And they started to become little villages then. So if you want to get a good idea of what the little house is and the vibe was like back then, you can go up to a, a place called Poe Park, a little north of us, where a cottage that was built in 1812 is still located. It's a little museum now, and it is where Edgar Allan Poe lived out some of his final days, uh, and also where in 1847, once upon a midnight dreary, his wife died uh, of tuberculosis. Yeah. Anyways, Miss Clem, Miss, his, his, his actual mother-in-law, lived with him until he died, uh, and then she finally moved out, which I guess shows you that, you know, sometimes to get rid of your in-laws, you gotta die yourself. <laughs> oh, those in-laws. Uh, I'm gonna die alone. Not for nothing, but right in front is 140th Street, which is also known as La Lupe Way. La Lupe is a famous Bronx site. She didn't grow up here. She actually is from Cuba and came over here, and she was called the Queen of Latin Soul. She sings that song uh, that goes, Teatro, lo tuyo es puro teatro. Huh? That was pretty good, right? Cam? Best ever heard. All right, take it easy. Turn the charm off, will you? Uh, and keep in mind, before, this is very important, the South Bronx is this whole section of uh, the Bronx, but it is made up of little neighborhoods. Like I said, Morrisania, Mott Haven. You have all these different parts that make up the South Bronx, but it's known as the South Bronx. And this has to do with its more recent history, which I'll talk about later. All 
right, so as the late 1800s came, the Bronx slowly started to grow. It wasn't a lot still. By 1890, there was only about 100,000 people uh, in the South Bronx, which is a fraction of you know the, the, the millions that were already in what would become New York City. Uh, but it, started, it was like, hey, we should do something here. I'm actually in front of the statue of Louis Heinz, who actually was the guy who was street grid creator, or whatever, he laid out the street grid for the Bronx. Another thing to mention would be that in 1874 was when New York City annexed the West Bronx and a lot of this area, and they slowly started to pick up what was the Bronx. So that's another thing to keep in mind, that it became part of New York City uh, before the actual uh, 1898 consolidation, which I've talked about a billion times. If you don't know what this is yet, watch any of my freaking videos. I talk about 1898 is when all the five boroughs were consolidated, but the Bronx got pulled in piece by piece before that, a lot of it at least. So, yeah. But uh, one of the big things that the Bronx had was parkland at this time. In 1884, actually, the New York State Legislature actually approved the buying of 4,000 acres in this, in this borough here for parks. That's right. I don't know if you guys knew this, but actually the Bronx is home to two of the biggest parks in New York City. The biggest as well. Pelham Bay Park, Van Cortlandt Park. Those are two of the biggest in the whole city. In fact, Pelham Bay Park, which is a little north of us, obviously, all right, relax. It is actually, you know, about three times the size of Central Park, just to give you an idea. That's pretty cool. Did you know that, Cam? I didn't think so. That's what we're doing here. But anyways, this is Joyce Kilmer Park, one of the many parks here in the Bronx. And Lewis Heinz was actually in charge of uh, hiring this man we're going to talk about in our next stop who made this very, very important road here in the Bronx. So enough yammering, enough babbling. Let's keep it moving. All right, so we talked about Lewis Heinz at the Joyce Kilmer Park where we just were, but he's the guy who actually chose the man Louis Risse. Risse, he's a French guy from Lorraine, France. He was the guy who was charged with building this grand road, the Grand Concourse. Huh? Here it is in all its glory. This was kind of supposed to be the Champs-Élysées of uh, the Bronx. Uh, sorry for the pronunciation. I think it's pronounced Champs-Élysées. But uh, he built it, it was supposed to, it was this 180 foot wide, amazing, and actually he wanted it to be a place for racing horses and carriages. So, so it's like, I don't know, like a, the swift galloping and the furious, uh, you know, I don't know, but that's what he wanted originally. And it was during the 60s and 70s when the neighborhood declined that it was made more for actual automobiles. But uh, that was the, this was it. This was like the big grand uh, boulevard. They called it the middle class Park Avenue, uh, which is, I guess is, I don't know. I mean, you're, I don't know why you would want to call it that. And you're like, oh, you know Park Avenue? They're like, yeah, do you live there? Like, no, I live on the middle class version. So behind me is the Andrew Friedman home. Uh, this was actually uh, built uh, by a guy named Andrew Friedman who left money in his will to construct this in 1924. So this guy was actually a businessman, very broad. He, he, was a, he helped build the first uh, IRT, the subway. He had built, helped build Broadway theaters. He also was the owner of the New York Giants, which was the baseball team. Huh? which actually went to San Francisco, San Francisco Giants, in 1957. Anyways, he, had, he was in with Tammany Hall, which was very corrupt, and that's how he got a lot of these things. That's why he, his, his biographer actually said um, his way of making money was by means that are no longer traceable. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty cool way to describe how you make your money. I want the name of his accountant, that's for sure. But this was built as a home for the uh, elderly who were dying uh, poor. But the caveat was that those elderly had to have been rich at some point. So it was for like the, 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 uh, the formerly wealthy who basically were dying, you know, broke. How's that for a noble cause? I'm just waiting for some guy in Union Square to come up to me and say, hey, do you have a second? I'd like to, can you donate please to the formerly wealthy? Because, you know, Cornelius deserves a chance at, at dying in a luxury suite playing chess with his friends. Anyways, it lasted here until the 1980s and then it became a senior citizen center and today is home to like art exhibits and all those kinds of things, which is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, they have like resident artists and stuff. Pretty cool. Grand Concourse. All right. All right, so the Bronx starts to take off in the 1920s. This becomes kind of the destination for people like 
the Jews from the Lower East Side, they come over here and then their kids kind of are able to secure more, you know, money, better jobs, and then they want to move on up to places like the Grand Concourse, which we just talked about. Behind me is kind of a symbol of that. This is the Concourse Plaza. This is a hotel that was built in 1923, and it was kind of the IT hotel, man. This was the home of the Yankees, huh, which are right here, you know, that baseball team, obviously. Uh, you also had, uh, you know, presidents would stay here. When, and then they would come here for their, uh, basically their banquets, introducing themselves, as running as candidates, and they kind of had to get the stamp of approval here. Uh, people like FDR, people like uh, Harry Truman, people like JFK, all those people pass through here as their big coming out uh, as candidate kind of parties. Interesting story. Uh, FDR, there was actually an assassination attempt when he came here to the Bronx to visit. Um, there, he was at a motorcade. The, these women went up to a roof to get a better view and they saw some kid fidgeting with a gun. So they, they're like, hey, you, you freaking little brat. And the kid kind of panicked and shot them both. And then he runs and the police kind of cornered him somewhere and he ends up shooting himself. It's a little dark, but uh, the women survived. That's important. But at the time, it was like the height of fashion. I mean, even in the movie, the 1956 film, The Catered Affair, which I'm sure you've seen, Cam, uh, starring Betty Davis. Uh, this is where Betty Davis wanted her daughter to have her wedding because it was such a cool, like amazing place. Uh, so a little cameo in that movie. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's on, probably on, I don't know if it's on Netflix, see, right next to the Squid Game. Uh, you can catch the latest Ernest Borgnine flick, uh, The Catered Affair. And to the left, you have the Bronx County Courthouse from 1933, a great example of Art Deco, which by the way, the South Bronx is actually the highest concentration of Art Deco next to uh, Miami Beach. Miami Beach is first, then the South Bronx. Obviously, I've talked about Art Deco in the past. L'Exposition d'Art Decoratif in the mid-1920s in, in France, a lot of the architects saw it, they came back with it, all the buildings and the construction projects get up and running and they don't really start taking off until the early 1930s when it basically defined that uh, kind of era for the United States. Now the reason they even got this project during the 1930s, which was the Great Depression, was because of the connection of FDR with people like Ed Flynn, who was the political boss here in the Bronx. Uh, he, was, uh, he helped, he helped uh, you know, FDR from back in his days as a state senator. He helped him get the Irish vote. He helped him get to become president. And he was actually at the conference at Yalta after World War II as a kind of his aide, a uh, big important name, Yalta. You remember that one for World War, all you were World War II buffs. All you 65 year old white men who are watching, I'm sure you recognize that name in your lazy boys <laughs> to World War II history. But uh, Ed Flynn also, here's another little tidbit. The phrase, in like Flynn, comes from Ed Flynn and his connections that he had with powerful people. In like Flynn, you see that? You guys probably recognize that, probably heard your parents using that phrase among phrases like bees knees and we shouldn't have had kids. Not to digress too much, but I wanted to mention, since we did mention Miami and FDR, Miami was the one place where there was actually an assassination attempt on FDR. And no, he didn't, they, someone didn't try to, you know, sell timeshares to him to death. They actually was a whole thing. So this guy, 5'1", this Italian guy got up on a box to shoot him and some woman saw him, hit him last second. He misses and hits the mayor of Chicago, unfortunately, who died. But the mayor of Chicago did say on his deathbed to FDR, I'm glad it hit me and not you, which I'm sure his wife and kids disagreed with wholeheartedly. But that was an interesting episode in American history. We can digress all day long, baby. I got to keep moving. You got the Concourse Plaza and you got the Bronx County Courthouse. Let's go. All right, so let's go to post-World War II. This is a big marker for lots of cities around the country uh, because post-World War II, industry leaves the cities. It, highways are developed. Uh, they go out and they, they take the jobs with them. Another thing that happens at post-World War II is you have what's called white flight. And no, white flight isn't the name of a super racist airline. It was a phenomenon where white people left the cities too. And that was because of mortgages and suburbs being developed. Problem was with those mortgages weren't available to minorities. Uh, by actual government policy. How terrible is that? If you don't know the word redlining, this is actual government policy. One of the biggest tragedies in American history. This should be up there taught with, you know, like the assassination of Abraham Lincoln or the creation of a sequel to Dumb and Dumber. Terrible. And what happened was the government was dictating to banks who, in, who they should loan to, uh, especially these mortgages that were uh, given, that were backed by the federal government, and they created these maps with different levels of I guess, uh, loanability. Four levels, the worst one being red. So they would map out the red parts saying you shouldn't loan to these people. Those red parts were always neighborhoods with minorities and immigrants. Pretty messed up, huh? 
So this kept neighborhoods like the Bronx, like Bushwick, like Bed-Stuy depressed for a very long time and also prevented uh, black people specifically, their ability to accrue wealth, very important. Uh, because while African-Americans earn 60% of what white people earn as wages in the United States, they only have 5% of the wealth. And it's partly because of things like redlining. Now keep in mind, post-World War II is also when you had certain influxes of migrant groups here. Uh, one, Puerto Ricans, they were coming over. Before World War II, you had around 60,000 Puerto Ricans. Today you have over 700,000. And they started coming in after World War II. One of the reasons being they were looking for jobs in places like the Bronx where those jobs were leaving, unfortunately, leaving those Puerto Ricans to settle in poorer neighborhoods, have less resources, be less educated, etc. Not good. You also had another migrant group and that was African-Americans from the South. The Great Migration was still going on. You know neighborhoods like Harlem where they got lots of people from the Great Migration early on in the 1910s, 1920s, uh, but post-World War II it continued on and they came to neighborhoods like the Bronx as well. Uh, this was because they were escaping the South, which was a nightmare in, in that time. You know, the Jim Crow South was not fun. Over six million uh, African-Americans moved from the South to cities in the West, in the Midwest, and in the Northeast. Uh, in the, the time from 1910 to the 1970s. That's a lot of people, man. It remade what we consider cities in the United States. Keep in mind, this led to things like blockbusting in neighborhoods like the Bronx. And what blockbust, no blockbusting wasn't, you know, looking for the last copy of Forrest Gump in a video store while your parents wait outside in the car. It was actually real estate developers and agents trying to get rid of the white population in a neighborhood at a very cheap selling price because they scared them and then taking those empty, buying those empty uh, houses and then selling them at a steep increase to the black families and the La Latino families that were moving into those neighborhoods at the, around the same time. So one of the things that was, was done here in the Bronx because of all this, uh, I guess, tumult was you had, you had what was called blight. These were blighted areas and people like Robert Moses would come in here and basically demolish parts of the neighborhood and build things like what's behind me. This is a highway. It's not the highway I'm talking about because that's too far, but it looks like it. It's the, the one I'm talking about is the Cross Bronx Expressway, which goes from one side of the Bronx to the other. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like over seven miles and it basically just demolished dozens of thousands of homes of people and completely basically slit the throat of the South Bronx. And uh, it really didn't recover. A lot of those immigrants also who lived in the neighborhood were like, screw this, we're getting the hell out of here. And it depressed the land value and basically sunk it further. And it's around this time that the South Bronx becomes what it is today in size. As the neighborhood became more and more depressed, uh, you had more things happen. We're gonna talk about this at our next spot, but uh, it all kind of started getting lumped together. The different you know, neighborhoods and names, Morsenia, Mott Haven, et cetera, they all started to get lumped into the South Bronx and it grew and grew and grew over the decades in the 70s and 80s uh, as, it as it fell into further depression. Don't worry, it's gonna pick itself back up, baby. We're gonna to get to that, so let's keep it moving. All right, so now I'm gonna be talking about how the neighborhood kind of declined. Uh, you're probably thinking, but Tom, wait a minute. That neighborhood that you're in right now looks pretty nice. First of all, uh, don't ever even think of interrupting me again. Uh, second of all, listen. This is Charlotte Street, all right? Charlotte Street was home to five and six story buildings in the early 1900s and lots of Jewish families actually lived here. After World War II, which I've talked about, a lot of those Jewish families moved out and those buildings emptied out and they started to get filled and their vacancies started to be filled by uh, actual uh, Puerto Rican families and black families moving here, which I already talked about at the last stop. Uh, but another thing you had is a lot of welfare families and here, this street actually kind of symbolized the arson that the Bronx became famous for. You guys have all heard the phrase, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning. Uh, it comes from the World Series in 1977, which by the way, uh, it's a great book. You should check it out. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen the Bronx is burning by Jonathan Mahler. Uh, you know, big deal, I read books. <laughs> But it refers to the phrase that uh, is accredited to Howard Cosell at the World Series in 1977 at Yankee Stadium, where he talks about how literally they were filming these aerial shots of buildings burning down in real time. And he says, uh, the fire department has its work cut out for it. Sure has its work cut out for it. I'm Howard Cosell. Hey. Pretty good impression, right, Cam? Thanks. 
Uh, but this is the street that kind of symbolized it all. Charlotte Street was burning down. All the dozens of buildings here were being burnt down, so much so that in 1977, when Jimmy Carter came to visit the Bronx, this is the street he came to. And if that's not enough, in 1980, when Ronald Reagan was also running for president, he came to this street as well. So it's kind of interesting. It was a really bad place. Just to give you an idea how bad it was, uh, in the 70s, uh, New York City had more fires than uh, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, and LA combined. Uh, engine number 82 here in the Bronx uh, in the year 1970 reported over 4,000 fires. That's 11 a day. 11 a day. And that wasn't even the peak. The peak hit in 1976 where there was like over 30,000 fires reported that year. Uh, so it was a real mess. I mean, they were just constantly moving. The fire department was completely exhausted. And the reason they would burn buildings down was there was a few reasons. One was to get the insurance money. The buildings were worth more burnt down than they were uh, standing and they weren't getting much in rent, none of that. So they just burnt them down, got the insurance. The second was actual tenants who were on welfare and things. They wanted to get into nicer places. So the only way they could get out because the waiting list was so long for other places was to burn down their building. And the last was junkies. Junkies would burn down the place. A lot of people were professional stripping, professionally stripping the building, so all that kind of stuff. Those were all different factors, and they were going down all over the neighborhood. Today, this is now called Charlotte Gardens. Uh, these, these houses were built up in the 1980s. Another example of how the neighborhood was built up is one of these uh, organizations in the neighborhood uh, that was actually, this was called the Mid-Bronx Desperados. And they, were, they, were, they organized groups and organized different things. And then they were, used that kind of leverage to take money from the federal government, from the state, et cetera, and use that to develop certain parts of the neighborhood that needed it. And now you have these little, uh, basically suburban houses here in the middle of the Bronx that are very pretty. And a lot of the people still live here, the same people who moved in back then. Now, keep in mind, in the 70s too, you had lots of gangs come up as well. So you had lots of gangs. In fact, the Turbans was the name of the gang that was here on Charlotte Street back in the day. You had all kinds of gangs throughout the 70s and 80s. Uh, and then the 80s come and you have, obviously, drugs and crack take off. But all these things were kind of go going on at the same time. And the Bronx was the symbol. The South Bronx, especially, was the symbol for urban decay for the entire country, uh, which is pretty wild to think about. All right, we got to keep moving. We got a lot to cover, so <clears throat> let's go. All right, so I was telling you how the neighborhood fell into disrepair. You had all the fires and everything, but it was around this time, believe it or not, that the South Bronx became the South Bronx. But it was really the people here who kind of brought it out of this decay through different community groups, like I was talking about the Mid-Bronx Desperados, but also groups like the Southeast Bronx uh, Community Organization, which is SEBCO, still around today. Interesting fact, that was actually run by a man named Father Louis Gigante, who uh, is an Italian man, there's a statue of him over there in Gigante Plaza, but he was the brother of Vinny the Chin Gigante. He's actually the head of, or was the head of Sebco until he passed away and left $7 million to his illegitimate son because he was a father, he's a priest, and he had a son. Isn't that crazy? A whole scandal. Uh, that was actually fairly recently. So this guy started Sebco and they took uh, federal money and gave it out to different organizations and developed the neighborhood. So these were the groups that kind of picked up the Bronx and made it what it is. And today it's getting, I guess, capitalized on a little more, as you can see behind me, uh, more development and all those types of things. But you had also uh, art and culture kind of come up out of uh, the Bronx, famously at 1520 Sedgwick, a little bit up from where we are now, a little bit north, you have the birthplace of hip hop. That's where DJ Cool Herc at this uh, apartment building and, and basically the, the rec room would have these parties and they began basically the, the idea of everything, the culture of hip hop as we know it. But I'm also standing in front of what is the Hip Hop Museum. This is the uh, Hip Hop Museum that just recently, uh, they're starting, I guess, the process of opening it. it hasn't opened yet, but uh, you know, it's, it's kind of commemorating that history of uh, hip hop here in the Bronx. So these kinds of things all came out of this time in the Bronx where it was struggling so much. Anyways, I'm in front of here also Bronx Point. This is Bronx Point. This is one of the big developments here in, uh, in the Bronx. And it's kind of, you know, it's big and it's not cheap. So that's like uh, Hudson Yards prices. And the last thing you want is the Bronx to turn into Hudson Yards. The last thing you want is any place to turn into Hudson Yards. But this is the kind of thing that is, it's kind of going up in the neighborhood right now. Sadly, this was given away to a developer pretty much by the city. This was supposed to be an extension of this park that we're in right now, Mill Pond Park. And it was given away to a developer by the city. Now, it's important to note that these 
you know, the developers and these kind of like, especially luxury development, is taking advantage of the reputation and the culture that was started in this neighborhood. So for example, in 2015, two big developers threw a party up here in the South Bronx to kind of showcase their latest investment, right? And they got all these stars and people to come up, Gigi Hadid, and Naomi Campbell, but they put on this party that basically, they, they put up these trash cans that had fires in them, bombed out cars and graffiti. It was the biggest and most embarrassing caricature of the Bronx's history in like history. Uh, and this is 2015. You can just imagine, you know, like, you know, Gigi Hadid in her bathroom in Tribeca or wherever, like saying, oh, hey everybody going to the Bronx tonight. Hope I don't die. <laughs> so bro life, hashtag. Uh. You know, that's what they call it, by the way. A lot of people are call, trying to call it so bro. So bro. Come on, that is cringe, as the kids say. But you have also the neighborhood being built up too, which is good. So for example, we're on the Harlem River, you have what's gonna be eventually the Harlem River Greenway, which is gonna go all along the, the river here uh, from one side to the other. Uh, you have the Bronx River, actually been, it's been, you know, also that Bronx River rest restoration project started in the 70s. Uh, it's just now that there's more of an interest in getting it off the ground and, and spurring it along that has come along. People say that there's a housing crisis in New York City. It's a, an affordable housing crisis that's actually going on. So people pretend like adding all this luxury development is really gonna help things, but most of the condos in New York, most of the condo buildings aren't you know, half empty anyway. It's affordable housing that we need, remember that. Because look, finding a, an apartment in New York, I can tell you this from experience, is a nightmare, nightmare endeavor because of that. There's no affordable housing. In fact, I don't know if you knew this, but Real Estate Magazine Weekly just recently named finding an apartment in New York City as the number two most painful and humiliating uh, housing situation to be in. The number one situation is being a prisoner at Iraq's Abu Ghraib prison in 2004. Before you guys start typing away and say, oh, well, what do you want it to be bombed out and dangerous and gangs running around? No, obviously. But what would be nice is if you can make it safe and affordable and pretty and greenways for everybody. What a concept, huh? And it's important, remember, is the people here who live here, who, who made this neighborhood what it is, that also brought it to where it is today. So we should take care of those people too. All right. Oh man, we did it. We finished the video. Look at us, we're at the end. Wow, we, we covered a lot there, man. We covered it from when it was farmland to when it started booming to when it became the destination for immigrants moving on up to when it declined to back and today and its rebound. Man, there was a lot to cover there, but we tried, we did it. And yeah, I get it. We couldn't cover everything, so chill out. You're gonna start typing away on the things that I didn't cover. Hey, this is a gigantic area, okay? We tried as much as we could for 25 minutes around that. If you like the video, you know the drill, baby. Check out the Patreon. Like I said, there's extras on there. That's how I fund everything, man. That's how you vote. Vote with your dollar, I guess. Uh, you know, you don't have to, I guess. It, times are tight. So, very least, you know, give it a little like and subscribe. I don't know what to tell you. All right. Let's do it. Thanks for watching. Seriously, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. See y'all later. Sick. <laughs>